My name is Jerry. I'm a pastor here at Richland Church Nazarene. Hi, Facebook folks. If you've never seen us, met us, um, yeah, that's who I am. Um, and uh, we are in week oh, four or five, I think, of our series, uh, Does Character Even Count? And you are free to go onto our website, and you can look at past videos and find out where we've been, and, and you can listen to a podcast. If you don't really like to look at me, that's all good and fine. Um, Technology is amazing about that. Uh, last week, Jesus conferred on us two amazing titles, just, just amazing, amazing titles. We are the salt of the earth, and we are also the light of the world. Those are pretty cool things. And as salt of the earth, we are the preservatives of the earth. We make the earth taste good. And we learned last week that if we don't do our job like salt needs to do, uh, the earth rots, right? It just begins, it begins to stink, and, and it gets really, really nasty. Um, and, and in the same way that a light is placed on a stand so that everybody can benefit from its light, and in the same way that a town is placed on a hill so that it can't be hidden, um, you have been strategically placed. You are like a town on a hill, every single one of us here. And I know you're all pushing back, going, no, I'm kind of here by mistake. No, you have been placed here on purpose by your Heavenly Father to do what? To do amazing acts of sacrificial love. Right? So in the same way that a town is placed on a hill, in the same way that a light is placed on a light stand, in verse 16 it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, uh, Luke, you know, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Luke separates these two teachings of salt and light for good reason. He's got a great reason behind those. Um, but Matthew puts them together, and, he, and together they make a rather... Um, a complete statement uh, uh, for, for us as followers of Jesus Christ. And we, we could sum it up like this. We summed this up last week. You have been strategically placed like a light to carry out strategic acts of sacrificial love, salt, that will glorify God, not you, glorify God and draw people to him, not you. But this morning I'd like to do, reintroduce two related phrases related to salt and light but are radically different than being salt of the earth and, and light of the world. Um, rubbing salt in a wound and being blinded by the light. All right, these two phrases, rubbing salt in a wound, I have no idea why you would do that. I get that salt osmosis, you know, that pulls liquid out. I mean, I get all that. Um, but the idea what we come, uh, rubbing salt in a wound is... Uh, Making a bad situation worse, right? That's, that's kind of the way we use that phrase. If you rub salt in a wound, you've added insult to injury. And, and you understand being blinded by the light. I love flashlights. I can see where I'm going, but if somebody turns it around this way, it's going to be very difficult. I don't like it shining in my eyes, right? A little overpowering. And so rubbing salt in a wound and being blinded by the light, if we're not careful in handling the love of Christ, we can be making situations worse a whole lot worse. See, because here's the deal. Jesus left with his disciples some very, very specific instructions, right? This is how people will know that you're my disciples. And this is how people will know that you're the ones with the really, really good news, right? Jesus says this in John chapter 13, verse 35. This is how people will know. It says this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The problem, and we all know this, is that in the name of love, look at world history, there have been some horrible things done in the name of love, right? We, we see this. We see it all the time. In the name of Jesus, in the name of God, we have we've dragged the name through the mud. We, we didn't lift it up. We didn't exalt it. We just did really, really, really horrible, horrible things to each other. And I think part of the problem is that we either skipped over or we didn't spend enough time digging into the verse right before verse 35. I'm going to show you verse 34 and 35 together here, kind of put them together, and, and maybe this will kind of help us understand where, where we went wrong, right? Where, where we went wrong with this incredible love that we've been given to pass along, and we hurt people with it. It says this, a new command I give you, love one another. Now, now this isn't a new command. Throughout the, new, excuse me, throughout the Old Testament, the Jewish people had been told to love one another. In Leviticus chapter 19, love your neighbor. You know, that's where Jesus got his, you know, his two greatest commandments. So this is really nothing new, but this next part, this was the new part. This is the part that kind of challenged everybody. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. There's the qualifier, and that's a huge qualifier. That's a qualifier that we don't want to skip over too quickly because the way Jesus loved was kind of nuts, right? He was all over the map. Like one, at one point, he's all grace, and at other points, he's all truth, and, and just terribly, terribly confusing. And we, we try to, well, what would Jesus do? And at halftime, we're going, I don't know what would Jesus do. This is, a, this is like, this is complicated. Anyone ever, 
use that phrase, it's, it's complicated, right? Because there's, there's, there's some nuances in the situation. It's not pure this. It's not pure that. So, Old Testament love was understood wrongly to have kind of limits, right? You only had to forgive somebody seven times, and after that, you know, they're on their own. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It was understood, and I think wrongly understood, that, that love had legal limits, right? You, uh, the legal limit says, I don't have to love that person anymore or at all, right? It, it, was, it was almost like, and again, wrongly understood, um, you, you loved as long as you were no longer in danger of being punished. Then you could stop loving. Right? That was kind of the idea, the, kind of the understanding, wrong, wrong, but that was the, where people arrived with their Old Testament understanding. But to love like Jesus loved, selflessly, sacrificially, and here are the two hard ones. These are the two that throw us, understandingly and forgivingly. Selflessly and sacrificially, we've been looking at That's a little bit easier to understand, right? Love costs, right? If you've ever loved somebody, you know love costs. If you're a parent, you know love costs. It's never free. It costs. But understandingly and forgivingly, those, those two just make it a little bit... Uh, a little more difficult to, to, to nail down, to nail down. Um, too much, too much for understanding, too much forgiving, and, and it's like rubbing salt in when you run the risk of making a situation worse. For example, hey, it's okay if you sleep around. God still loves you. Nothing can bad can happen from you sleeping around because God loves you. He'll take care of everything. Right? You're, you're, you're being gracious, but I don't think you're making the situation any worse. My guess is the situation could become very, very much worse if you're telling people, hey, it's all good and fine if you sleep around. Nothing bad could possibly happen. And the rest of us are going, oh, oh you need to tell them the truth. And maybe sometimes we don't have enough understanding and we're not forgiving enough. And that's when we, we, we make a situation worse. It's like blinding somebody with the light. Right? You still haven't tackled that addiction. You're still having that issue. You must not be reading your Bible. You must not be praying. You just must be a lousy Christian. I don't know why we even let you into this place. A little bit too much light, a little blinded, blinded by the light. So what I want to do this morning, I just want to just stop for a moment because a lot of you have been talking to me, and, and, and this has been the building of this message here this morning. A lot of you have been asking me, I had this situation and I don't know if I gave too much truth or too much grace. And I had this situation, and I have a feeling I gave a little bit too much truth, and I gave a little bit too much grace, you know, one or the other. And, and, and my guess is, folks listening online at home, folks here in the, in the building, um, one of two things is true with every person in this room, and, and, and again, listening, um, more than likely, more than likely, you have faced a situation where you either gave too much truth and maybe you're thinking about that moment right now. You're like, wow, I, I really blasted them. Or maybe you're thinking about a moment you gave too much grace and like, I should have stood for the truth on that one. Or maybe you have a situation right now and you're wondering, how am I going to handle this one? If I'm going to be Christ-like, how am I going to be Christ-like? Because this situation is complicated. Right? Lord, help me. So I just want to stop right, right now and I just want to pray specifically for each and every one of you, your situation and where you're trying to balance love and grace. Truth and grace, are you going to forgive them or are you going to hold their feet to the fire, right? And, and you're, you're debating that in your mind right now. I think you, the Holy Spirit is, has, has put a situation right there in your mind's eye. So if you all bow with your heads, I just, I just want to stop. And, and before we hear God's word and before we hear about how Jesus handled this incredible um, tension between truth and grace, which is going to inform us in such a powerful way, uh, I think we need to just maybe, number one, we need to confess. Maybe you all know I, that you were too hard or too soft. And not only a prayer of confession, but a prayer of, of, of empowerment. Father, show me how to handle this situation, because I don't know. So you all bow your heads. Father, again, we, we want to be like your son. We want to do what Jesus did. Um, but he did so many different things, and he was like all over the map. And Lord, we want to be true to him. We want to be full of truth and we want to be full of grace. 
but in our world, in our, the, our limited view of things, we, we tend toward half grace and maybe half truth. Father, if we're going to be like your son, we have to embrace the way he was able to live with both grace and truth, and he was okay with the tension. He didn't try to fight it. He didn't try to resolve it. He simply offered 100% grace and 100% truth. And he flip-flopping all over the place. Father, you, you know this. And so you understand our confusion. How did he do it? Father, this morning, your, your disciple, your apostle, John, is going to show us some things. Um, Father, give us ears to hear. Open up our hearts. If we've, been, if we've been leaning really hard toward grace, Father, help us see some truth this morning, no matter how difficult it would be. And Father, if we've been hardcore and shining light in people's eyes, Father, soften our hearts this morning. Help us to see like your son saw. Father, help us get love right. It's only if we get love right that people will recognize us as your disciples and that's the only reason they'll come to us is if they in fact recognize us as your disciples not just a group of people doing this that or the other thing but as a group of your disciples father help us to navigate these confusing waters between truth and grace and it, it'll be messy and it'll be confusing maybe sometimes it's going to seem unfair but Father, help us to be okay with that because your son seems to be, seems to have been okay with it and he, he seemed to flourish. And people, he attracted people in droves. He just had this beautiful mix of truth and grace, Lord, that we could pull that off. That we wouldn't repel people, but nor would they find this a place of cheap grace. You know more than anything, Father, how much love costs. Thank you for paying the price. We couldn't ever, and you paid because you knew love costs. So, Father, this morning helps us to get love right. As we continue to worship, as we dig into your word, Again, soften our hearts, open our ears so that we could hear and apply what you have for us this morning. In your son's name I pray. Amen. John chapter 13, verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, it sounds so easy, right? I mean, we got an instruction book right here. Just, right, whatever Jesus did, you bust open to the Gospels and you just find out what he did. Like, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, how difficult can it be? Oh, there goes one of your guitar picks. There, Dan, here we go. I said, I will never knock those off. Sounds so easy to love just like Jesus. But again, as you read through the Gospels and how Jesus lived and loved, he's not at all as clear cut as we would have liked him to be. Right? Because, again, he, he's all over the map. He's, like, really, really, really harsh at one moment, and he's, like, really, really nice <laughs> another moment. Right? But the fact of the matter is he loved sacrificially and selfishly, selflessly, um, but he also loved with understanding and forgiving, which made his love incredibly messy, inconsistent, straight out unfair. You look at a few of the places. I mean, you, you got to arrive at, wow, that was not very fair. Right? And at the end of the day, it's just, just a little bit confusing. And again, maybe some of you were raised in a church that's all into uh, grace, right? And maybe it was a healthy kind of grace, and maybe it was an unhealthy kind of grace. Remember the Corinthian church? They were all proud of, um, uh, we have so much love here that we got a, a man sleeping with his dad's new wife. <laughs> but, oh, we're all about love. So that's an unhealthy grace, right? Um, and, and, and some of you maybe weren't even raised in church. You were raised with parents that were just like, just loving, full of grace, like no rules. And, you know, just, just, just wonderful. And again, some of you were raised in churches or by parents with just a lot of truth. And it was kind of living under the, like the, the Inquisition, right? Every Sunday, if you didn't produce enough 
evidence of your faith, it was like, okay, take them out back and burn them, but we're going to have a potluck right afterwards, so good times, good times, right? And, and, and it, again, it, it's so difficult to nail down how Jesus loved. And again, a lot of you have been asking me, I, I think I was too hard, or I don't think I stood for the truth, or I was too soft, or, or, or this, and, and, and my suggestion again this morning is that we embrace, that we embrace, we don't get out of, we don't run from that tension uh, between truth and grace. And, and I get it, right? I was listening to uh, uh, one pastor, and he's talking about how this, this tension plays out in churches. And, and he explained how a gay couple had come up and, and was explaining to him why they attended his church. They said, we, you know, there's, there's, there's churches that kind of cater to, to gay couples, and, and we had attended a couple of those churches. But we had, and this is just one, one, one story. He said, but, but this man told this pastor, we got the distinct impression that they weren't telling us the whole biblical truth. They were like coddling us, and we know that you are telling the truth. You're a Bible teaching church, and we're not all that comfortable with it, but at least, see, because we want to know what the Bible says, and we didn't think the other guy was really telling us the whole truth. And so can we keep coming to your church, and is it okay if we keep greeting? I know you're not going to probably let us up on the stage, you know, but can we, can we serve? And this pastor said, yeah, yeah. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you know, lots of grace and, and maybe, you know, lots of truth. This, but one pastor says, says you know, I, I, sometimes I preach on adultery and, you know, marriage and premarital sex and all that. And he says, you know what? I don't advertise it because <laughs> none of you would come to church that Sunday. And if you happen to come to church that Sunday and you were maybe not married, living with your partner, whatever... The report is it's like getting a, a root canal without any painkiller, right? It's the most excruciating Sunday morning in church that you've ever experienced. But then those same people come back and told that same pastor, you know, that we went home, we were so uncomfortable, we kind of hated you, um, we swore we'd never come back, but then we went home and we had the best conversation. And we recognized that a couple of things that you said, you nailed it. That's why we were having these, conversa- these, these difficulties in our relationship. So thank you. Hated it, but thank you. Don't attempt to break or resolve the tension between truth and grace. This is the way Jesus loved. He loved with both grace and and truth. And if we jettison either one of them, or if we lean too much into either one of them, we lose something vital to the way that Jesus loved. And he continues to love us. Because again, as we read the Gospels, we quickly realize, again, at one time he's, he's like crazy forgiving, and then at other times he holds people to just in, insanely high levels of accountability, like you can't even think of something without getting into trouble. Right? And then sometimes, again, he's really, really nice. Sometimes he's really, really harsh. Sometimes he points out the smallest of sins, and other times he, like, ignores sin altogether. And you're just thinking, wow, it was right there, and you never said a word. Is there, like, a deeper meaning, right? That's where we all go to. There must be a deeper meaning. Like, so they're going to find the fifth gospel, and they're going to tell us it's okay to sleep with your boyfriend. No, that's not going to happen. It's... Lost my... Where am I? <laughs> Jesus loved messily. He loved inconsistently. And he was okay with it, right? He was able to minister through that, what we would call confusion. And it seems to me that if he was messy and inconsistent and maybe a little bit unfair and and really confused, I think it's okay for us to kind of bounce back and forth. We all, we, again, we want Jesus to, to land one place or the other. Look, you're either going to be Mr. Truth or you're going to be Mr. Grace, but stop trying to be both. You're really confusing me, right? Because I'm, I'm an older brother type and I got, you know, the truth and I got my little brother and he's all about grace and man, land somewhere because then I can be right and my brother can be wrong. That's where we want Jesus to agree with us, right? That's truth. Preach it, brother. So we're going to look at the, the Gospel of John. Uh, John was written later than the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, the first three were written probably within 30 years of the death of Jesus Christ. That would be somewhat like me writing down a story right now, the reunification of Germany. That happened about 1990. Could you, would you conceive that I could go find eyewitnesses to the actual reunification of Germany in 1990? Would you raise your hand if you believe I can go find a ton of eyewitnesses? Would you? Yes? Okay. Every hand in the place is raised. They weren't. They're all half asleep if you're watching online. Um, 
But, but it wasn't that long ago. It was only 30 years ago. So uh, again, what these gospels are saying, the first three, this was in such recent memory. Literally, they're saying, look, go ask folks. If what we're saying is not true, just go ask people. There's hundreds of people who will give witness to what we're saying here. Anyway, the book of John written way later. John's an old man. He's on the island of Patmos. He's either there in, in Ephesus, not terribly certain. Um, everybody else is dead. They've all been hanged, crucified, burned alive, flayed. I mean, you name it, they got it. He's heard rumors. Some of them have just disappeared. No idea. He has no idea. And his followers are saying, look, you got to write some of this stuff down. So his gospel is a little bit different than Matthew, Mark, Luke. Those are kind of follow maybe a biological kind of thing. But with the book of John, it's like a, a, a position statement, like a, 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 a theological treatise. It's, it doesn't follow the chronology of Jesus' life. It's, it's, um, it's a proof. It's a proof paper. John's literally stepping out to say, I'm going to prove that this was the Son of God. So he's got like seven statements and seven miracles and, and self, self-identifying. I mean, he's got a bunch of sevens, right? Bottom line, John is radically different than the other Gospels. So he's writing to a very, very, very Jewish audience by this time. Um, and he's trying to explain a very distinctly Jewish idea to a Greek audience. So he's really got to think through his presentation, and it's really beautiful the way he does this. I mean, and the other place that I love it, uh, Paul does it when he goes to Mars Hill, right? Go home and read Acts and, and look at Paul's strategy as he, as he interacts with the Greeks. But anyway, um, John is going to present the gospel. He's going to present Jesus to the Greeks, and he understands that they have two ideas. He's going to latch on to these two ideas. They're not the biggest ideas in the Greek word, but they're two very important ideas. The first is the idea of the logos, Right? To the Greek mind, there was such thing as the logos, and this was literally the mind of God. Right? Everything that you see beautiful in the world is a result of the logos, the mind of God. It's existed forever. And, and the logos, if, if a man is rational and he's a, he's a good guy, then the logos resides in that man. It's not necessarily God, as us or the Jewish people would, would call it, but it, this... this the mind of the universe, right? And this other idea is that there, there were two worlds. One, the world that we see around us. It's a wonderful world, all good and fine. But what you see is really copies of realities, right? Not, not the real thing. And there's, there's this, 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 so this is kind of a shadow world. And then there's this real world. There aren't any shadows. I mean, everything there is real, there's no fakeness about it. I mean, it's the real deal. And so there's these two worlds, and we live in the one shadow world. And so John tells the Greek people, this was amazing. He tells them that in this man, Jesus Christ, the, the, the logos and this real world is all wrapped up into this one man, Jesus Christ. Christ in this person, the personhood of Jesus Christ. So he says it this way in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning was the mind of God. In the beginning was this perfect world somewhere. And that was Jesus. And, the, and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God, right? If you're following what John is doing, he's, he's, he's describing how Jesus is God. And the Greeks push back a little bit because they, you know, how can evil matter and, and beautiful spirit, how can they be, uh, go to that another time? Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And then a bit further on, he gives us the two words that capture our dilemma as lovers of Jesus and as, as people who want to love like Jesus loved. And, and John takes these two words that we've been looking at and he applies them to the personhood of Jesus. It's like this is what Jesus is made of. It says this in verse 14. The word Jesus, the mind of God, this perfect reality, Jesus Christ in the flesh, became flesh this reality, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In other words, Jesus tabernacled is really the word. He camped out. He didn't move permanently. He was only here for 30, 33 years. But he came and moved into the neighborhood, right, so that we could truly understand, so that he could truly understand what's it like to live in our neighborhood. What is it truly like? And then we would be able to identify with him, and he'd be able to identify with us. Just what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture. And then it says this, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. You see that we, again, that's like me and John and, and, and Matthew, and we all saw it. And not only us, there were hundreds of others. We all saw it. This isn't some story that we got handed down to us. You've been reading accounts. We were there. 
If you want to ask us any nuanced questions about what happened, we were there. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. And then this, this is the, this is the kicker. We have seen the glory, the glory of the one and only Father who came from the Son, full of grace and truth. Full to the brim of both grace and truth. I mean, we all know grace and truth, right? Truth says you're accountable, right? Grace says, no, you're not, you're forgiven, right? Truth says that you're broken, and grace says, no, nah, you're fine, you're fine. Truth says you're going to have to pay for that, and grace says, no, nah, I got it, I'll pay for it. So you've all experienced truth and grace in your life. They're, 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 just, they're, they're part of the, the fabric, the very fabric of life. And again, maybe many of you were raised by Mr. Truth and Mrs. Grace. Maybe in some of your homes it was Mrs. Truth and Mr. Grace. My parents took turns. They were, they were just, you know, he was real rough sometimes, and, and mom was real tough sometimes, and at other times he wouldn't hurt a fly, and, and other times we would laugh at mom when she chased us with the ruler. I mean, you know, they, they, they kind of took turns, and I have a feeling in, in, a, in a healthy home there's a, there's a balance of truth and grace, a, a healthy balance of truth and grace. Um, John says this, says, I've been watching Jesus. I've been watching him for years, and here's what I saw again and again and again and again. He was full of both. He never was only one, right? He was always, he was always both. It's like water and oil. If I could pour water and oil into one container, you would quickly find that they, could, they remain separate. They don't become a weird mix, right? I mean, I could reach in there if I had the right tools. I could reach into a, a bucket that I poured both truth and grace, and I could reach in there at any moment. I could pull out pure truth, and it wouldn't be touched by grace. It would be pure truth. And I could reach in there, and I could grab pure grace, and it wouldn't be touched. You've seen oil and water. They, they simply don't mix. They say, that's, that's Jesus Christ. He was both. It didn't become, again, this, this kind of weird, weird kind of mix. And again, we want it to be one or the other. Like, like when I do something dumb, man, I'm all about grace, when you do something dumb, I'm all about truth. <laughs> I said, don't you look at me like that. Y'all are same way, exact same way. And sometimes we only want to give like half grace, right? Because they didn't deserve the other half. And do you realize what you're saying? Grace is what you don't deserve. No, wait a minute. How can they not deserve the other half of grace? That doesn't make a lick of sense. And sometimes, sometimes you only want to hear half of the truth. I remember telling my brother where babies came from, and he's like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. That was a really bad example. But you, you get the idea, right? Sometimes we, only, we don't want to hear the whole truth because it's just like too much. You can't handle the truth. Yeah, I thought you'd like that one. Then Jesus says this about, John says this about Jesus. And it's absolutely crucial in understanding how Jesus was able to be 100% grace and 100% truth. Watch this. Verse 16. Out of his fullness we have received, and this is the weirdest phrase, in some of your translations, it'll be grace after grace. Some of your translations, grace in place of grace. Uh, the new NIV, grace in place of grace already given. Uh, grace upon grace. And the idea being this. In the morning, you've all done this. You have a, you have a situation. And in the morning, you're, you're all about the truth, right? All about the truth. And then somehow by later in the afternoon, you, you almost need to switch gears, Right in your situation, and now now you have to be all about grace. And this passage is saying that Jesus is the same thing, right? Sometimes he's going to come to you, and he's going to unload 100% grace on you. Ten minutes later, his grace is going to look strangely like 100% truth because that's what you needed right then. And then about ten minutes later, he's going to give you a different. It might be truth, it might be grace, but he's going to give you what you need at that moment. But he's always going to have both. He's always going to have both. He's Again, not a balance, a full measure of both. Is it messy? Incredibly messy. Inconsistent? Yeah. Unfair? Yeah. Confusing? I guess so. And then just to clarify, verse 17, he says this, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now look at those two verbs. The law was given. It was given over time. It developed over time. But the word that Paul uses here, excuse me, that John uses here is begotten. It arrived full, complete, 100%, grace and truth. Bam, Jesus came, arrived in person, grace and truth. Law, 100% truth. 
but grace and truth. What an incredible combination. And this is what made Jesus so unpredictable and inconsistent, right? Everyone then and now we want him to land one way or the other, but he, he, like, he refuses. Again and again, he brings 100% grace and he brings 100% truth to the situation. Let me give you a couple examples. John chapter 4, Jesus is talking, Samaritan woman. You've all remember this one, Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, Jesus is talking to her, which is really graceful. Right? And she's got to be thinking, this Jewish rabbi is talking to me, a Samaritan woman. Strike, 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 you're out. I mean, nothing about the situation would have been correct. But Jesus was all Mr. Grace. And he's having this conversation with a woman, which was unacceptable. And a Jewish man, Samaritan. I mean, everything about it was just completely, completely unacceptable. And then suddenly, Mr. Truth shows up, like he's all Mr. Grace, and then Mr. Truth suddenly shows up. In in verse 16, it says, he told her, go back and call your husband and come back. And you can feel the sudden silence. She's like, wow, he turned quickly. (laughs) He was really nice a minute ago. I'm like, what? 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 I know she's thinking a line, but she says, um, well, she gives a half, half truth. I, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. And then does he back off? No. He like he takes a dagger and goes, oh, feel that? You feel that? Oh. And, and you're just thinking, wow, Jesus, back off. Just, right? The fact is, this is verse 18. The fact is you have five husbands. Like Jesus is not going to go easy on her, right? <laughs> Both feet, he's going to land on her. And the man you now have is not even your husband. Even the Samaritans know that that's not right. You're a relational nightmare. You're a marital train wreck, right? Maybe you ought to just call it quits. I don't know what happened to all your husbands, but you need to stop, right? You just need to stop. Maybe you need to be a nun, right? Literally, this is what Jesus is doing to this poor lady, like if nuns were around yet. Jesus was a little confused maybe at that point. But, and the poor woman, she's got to be thinking like these crazy desert preachers, too much time in the sun. Man, they get mean, like, this dude's flip-flopping all over the place. He was so nice to me, and now he's like, he's, he's being mean to me. <laughs> and then, just as suddenly as Mr. Truth had shown up, Mr. Grace returns, and he starts having a theological conversation with her. I mean, a rabbi, a Jewish man doesn't talk God with women, Samaritan women. I mean, oh, my goodness, this is just the worst. But she's thinking, wow, he turned quickly. Where'd Mr. Truth go? He was here a minute ago. Suddenly this guy's all being nice to me again. And then he says to her, I mean, they're having this conversation about the Messiah. And she says in verse 25, 26, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. I mean, they're just having this coolest conversation. It's just kind of a beautiful thing. And then Jesus declared, I mean, this has become just pure grace. He said, you're looking at the Messiah right now. You're eyeball to eyeball with the Messiah. And I haven't told anybody else this. That's how much I love you. That's how much I value you. And I want to give you living water that will quench your thirst that no man can ever be able to do. That's what I want to do for you because I love you. It's tax season. Another example, how many of you are digging the tax man right now? Nope, not me either, very much. So let's talk about Jesus and the tax collector, Matthew the tax collector, right? Okay, this is a bad situation. You You got God, right, and you got the Pharisees just a step below God. Right? And then you got the common people like you and I, right? And then you got sinners, like they're right, right down here. They're right now against the curb. You got the sinners. Okay, and then you got the tax collectors, like they're way down here in the gutter. Like you got to pull them up. I mean, you can't even see them. They're looking up, and you're like, yeah, you're a tax collector. You don't even get to come to church like the sinners. They can come into synagogue, but you're a tax collector. You stay down there. We don't want anywhere near you. This is how bad the tax collectors were. They were the worst of the worst. And Jesus decides, hey, we're going to go hang out with the tax collectors. And the disciples are like panicking, like, dude, dude, what about our rep- what, what, what about your reputation? <laughs> and Jesus is like, now you're getting it. Now, now you get it. Guys, we're going to give up our reputation to redeem theirs. I know the whole world's going to look at us when we arrive at that party. Your reputation is going to be done by about 6 o'clock tonight, right? Just, so just stop. That's why we're here. That's why I came. I didn't come to protect my reputation. I gave gave it away. That's why I came. 
And what about the criminals crucified on either side of Jesus, the two outlaws? One ridicules Jesus. And the other one says, hey, he's innocent, right? We're criminals and we deserve what we're getting. And you expect Jesus to go, oh, that's okay. You're, you're probably a nice guy, but you got no argument from Jesus. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the worst of the worst. <laughs> and the criminal humbly asked Jesus to remember him. And Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And you're just, you got to be like, whoa, 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 time out. Just a little while ago, not more than two or three chapters ago, a rich young ruler came up to you and said, what do I got to do to have eternal life? And this guy, you made him give away everything. You made him sell everything. And this guy, at the very last second, he didn't even repent. And even if he did repent, what's he going to do? He's got nowhere to go. He can't go sin anymore. His repentance is a little bit empty. And yet you're forgiving him just like that. Jesus, come on, land somewhere. What, what do we got to do to be loved by you? You say, you say one thing, and then you say something entirely different. <sighs> then the woman caught in adultery, probably the most famous story, John chapter 8. They bring her to Jesus. And they say, according to the law, she should be stoned, rocks thrown at her until she's dead. What do you say? And they were trying to catch him in a statement that would either get him in trouble with the Jewish authorities, the Sanhedrin, or get him in trouble with the Roman authorities. And Jesus like, yeah, you guys aren't nearly as smart as you think you are. I'm, I'm God. <laughs> um, so he decides to play along with them. He says, okay, let, let's, let's go by the law of Moses. Now, according to the law of Moses, the first one who throws the first stone has to be the one without sin. So if any of you in this crowd right now have ever had a thought if you're under the opinion that you would never, ever, or you have never, ever, you, go ahead, you throw the first stone. Right? You know the story. They all quietly slink away because they know. They know they're being hypocrites. They know. Jesus pointed it out so beautifully. And then watch this. He says to the woman, listen carefully now. I don't condemn you. Wow, Grace. Now go and sin no more. So, which is it? Are you not going to condemn her? Are you going to make her sin no more? Well, Jesus, come on. Land. Which is it going to be? Are you, could, I don't condemn her? Yeah, I don't condemn her. Well, Why do you have to bring up the sin part? Because you have to hear the truth too. I don't condemn you, but you need to understand the truth. See, Jesus was the embodiment of 100% grace and 100% truth. But that is so complicated, you say. What Christ is telling us is that's a good place to be. See, we're called to love like Jesus loved. John chapter 13, verse 34, as I have loved you. And here's how Jesus loved. Watch this. He called sin, sin. He called sin, sin. Then he paid for it. And then after having paid for it, he said, you're no longer condemned. And then after all that, now I want you to leave your life of sin. And if you don't, I still love you. If you can't, I still love you. See, as much as we love grace, we have to continue to talk about the truth. Here's why. Sin has a gotcha, right? Right? Jesus doesn't want it to get you. So Jesus is constantly like, here's the truth. Here's what will happen if you do that. Here's the truth. Here's what's going to be the consequences. This is the truth. I don't want sin to get you. So I'm telling you the truth. But here's why we can't let go of grace either, because sin already got us. Right? Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And grace is your only way back home. And for your friends and family who have, they're in a dark place. And if you're not the one that's going to give them grace, maybe they don't need truth right away. Maybe that can just wait. Maybe right now as they're drowning, the lifeline doesn't say truth on it. It says grace. And that's the only thing you say at that moment. If Jesus is the embodiment of both grace and truth... And if the church is, is his body, then we have to be comfortable with the messy, inconsistent, unfair, and confusing way that Jesus lived. And this is what I, I'm just absolutely convinced. The church is at its best when it embraces both grace and truth and refuses to let go of either. 
I know we don't know what to do with the tension, but we dare not let go of either one because there was a time in my life and there was a time in your life when you desperately needed the truth and there was a time in my life and I'm guessing there was a time in your life when you desperately needed grace. And we dare not be the church that ignores one for the other. I want to challenge us this morning online, at home, wherever you're at, that we would be a church full of grace and truth. And the world will look at us and they'll go, you're not being very consistent. You're kind of being messy. And you know what? We look back and we're good with that. Thank you very much. Bow your heads. Father, help us to love like Jesus loved. I know it's complicated and it's always messy and it's so confusing. Lord, but your spirit seems to nail the right thing at the right time if we would just be sensitive in every situation and not go half-cocked thinking that we've got the answer. Father, guide us by the power of your spirit. Guide us to be like Jesus. 100% grace and 100% truth. Father, thank you for Richland Church, the Nazarene. Thank you for all the churches around the world right now that are lifting up your name. Thank you, Father. In your son's name I pray. Amen.